All right. I think um, I think it's time about now, and uh, we we should start the course on uh, empirical economics. And a warm welcome from me. Um, I'm not really happy that we are only online again this term, but anyway, um, I'm happy that uh, many of you decided to attend this course. And let me just briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mark Treder. I'm a uh, professor of econometrics and uh, statistical economics at this faculty. And I'm going to teach this course this term together with Andreas. Um, and I'd like to ask Andreas to introduce himself now. All right, thanks, Mark. Uh, my name is Andreas. We have already met, I think, in most of you, uh, we have met in statistics too last year. Um, yeah, I'm happy to teach this course together with uh, Professor Trede. Um, yeah, and we'll see what we're going to see within the semester right now. Right, before we actually start, we experienced some difficulties with the learn web today. And um, it might, might therefore be a good idea for you to just scribble down the, uh, the number of the Zoom room, because in that case, you are independent of the learn web and you can enter the Zoom room um, independently from, from the learn web directly. And therefore, it might be a good idea to know uh, the room number. I think we can put it in the, into the chat. It's a uh, kind of longish number, six, four something. So I advise you to just scribble that down so that you can um, enter the room in any, in any case. Okay, so uh, let's start. And um, let me just share the screen. Okay, so um, we've already uh, told you that the, the name of this course is empirical economics and um, the name already tells you uh, what, what we are going to do in this term. We are going to talk about uh, empirical methods. How can we deal with data to find out um, things about the real world? So in a way, it's an extension of statistics into the real, uh, real realm of, of economics. And this is what we are going to do this term. Um, so just stopped working. Um, all right. So what are what are the objectives of this course? Well, of course, um, the objectives are to learn the, the methods of, of empirical work. Empirical work is quite important because nowadays we have a huge um, huge amount of data available, so many economic questions which could not be answered in the past are now open to empirical analysis. And this requires knowledge of empirical methods, which we are going to teach in this course. So the, the objectives are, in short, um, to learn and to be able to apply basic methods of empirical economics. Uh, the main workforce in empirical economics is traditionally, as in many other sciences, empirical sciences, traditionally the multiple linear regression model. So this will be our main topic. We won't start with the multiple regression model from, from, from the outset, but first deal with the simple linear regression model. But the main topic of this semester in this semester will be multiple linear regression techniques. We are not only working with this model theoretically, but um, it will be an important part of um, this course to really apply these methods to real data. So we are going to work with real data sets. You are going to work with real data sets. And to do so, you need knowledge of um, statistical software products. And we are going to work with the statistical programming language R which many of you are already acquainted with. And therefore, um, we, well, we, we are going to, to teach again from, from, from scratch how to use R in this course. And then at the end of the course, you will be hopefully quite proficient in using um, R to, to analyze economic data. Um, you might have realized that the workload of this course is higher than, than usual, which is um, the case because this course 
will earn you nine credit points rather than six, as most other courses modules. Um, therefore, um, you have a higher workload here. So don't be frustrated if you need more time than in other courses. This is intended. So this is not, um, not an accident. This is what we want you to do. Um, we are going to have 60 hours of roughly 60 hours of lectures and classes. More about that uh, later on. Um, the course outline um, goes as follows. Um, we are going to start this week um, with an introduction to, no, no, next week, mostly next week, with an introduction to R. Um, so Andreas is going to tell you step by step how to really start programming in R. Um, this will be one, one topic in the next week. Um, then after that, we are going on to introduce the simple linear regression model. Um, in statistics one, you have already encountered the basic idea of uh, linear regression models, but we are going to do that again more rigorously. And then after having um, dealt with the simple linear regression model, we are going to move over to the multiple linear regression model, so the main workhorse in economics. Um, we are going to talk about um, estimating about hypothesis tests in the multiple linear regression model and so on. And then we are going to do um, additional topics like, for instance, how can we deal with nonlinearities? So how would a nonlinear regression model would look like? So this will be another part of this course. Uh, we are going to talk about general procedure to assess the value of any econometric studies. So you won't only be able to perform econometric analysis uh, yourself. You should also be able to assess the value of econometric studies of other persons. So um, we are going to teach a set of criteria which you, which you can apply to really um, evaluate whether an econometric study is useful or in which setting it might be useful and when it is possibly less useful. After that, we are continuing with two um, additional topics. The first one is instrumental variables. That's a very vague term, but an, a very, very important method in nowadays uh, econometrics. And lastly, we are going to deal with panel data regression techniques. So more about that later on. But that's the general outline of this course for the entire semester. So it's quite a lot we are going to do. And this is why we are, uh, why, why you get nine uh, credit points for this course. The course um, is built along the lines of, of a textbook, of a textbook which is internationally used and which we are going to use as well. Um, the textbook is called Introduction to Econometrics. The authors are James Stock and Mark Watson. And the um, newest edition is from, from last year. That's the fourth global edition. Um, and I think it's a good idea to actually buy that book, even though it's, it's rather expensive. I, I'll show you that on the next slide. Um, but it's, it's an excellent book. It's um, didactically excellent, I think. And uh, it's a good idea to, to actually own that book because um, you can use that later on in other courses as well. There are other books which are quite, quite good. Uh, for instance, Ökonometrie einer Einführung, a German book by Ludwig van Auer. That's a colleague from the University of Trier. And um, there's also a workbook going along with with this uh, textbook, which is called Das R Arbeitsbuch, also by Ludwig von Auer, together with Sönke Hoffmann. Um, these books are directly also um, very good. Um, they give a deep introduction to econometric ideas and also how to use R. So these books, are, I think, are also um, a good idea to, to read. Anyway, the the main textbook in this course, the one we are really closely following, is uh, Introduction to Econometrics by Stock and Watson. As I said, the book is rather expensive. The paperback edition costs about 50 euros, but there's also an electronic version in the university's uh, uh, in, in the uh, university library. 
Um, it's not the newest edition, but that's not really important. So you can use the online edition of, um, of this book in the, uh, on the website of the university. Unfortunately, I found out this morning that we have only one license um, for the entire university. So this might be a kind of bottleneck, but in any case, let me just briefly show you how to enter um, how to enter the uh, university's library uh, site and how to find the book. Okay, so let me just briefly show you that. To do so, um, let me share another window. So I stop sharing this one and we continue with, uh, with the browser. Right. Okay, so you can easily find the university library by just typing ULB, Universities and Landesbibliothek Münster. And on the starting page, what you get is a very easy um, search window, very easy to use search window. You just enter the name of stock and Watson. And what you get is um, the first one is already the first search item is already. Um, oh, it's actually the fourth edition. So that's the, the newest edition. And you have access to the to the full text. So you have access to the entire book. But as I just said, it's only a single license. So this is, of course, a restriction. Um, you might also um, find um, books in the library that you can um, use additionally, but um, if you go to full text, you might have to register first, but after uh, registering, you can actually use the online edition of this book. Okay, so you can read it online or you can download um, chapters of this of this book. Okay, so that's very easy to use. And uh, let me also add, before I um, hand over to Andreas, let me also add that uh, we have a, um, a free license for data camp. So those of you who would like to do additional um, well, courses, online courses on, um, on programming issues can do so via the data camp link, um, which is available on the Learn website. So um, please have a look at the Learn website if it works and then you can find out about the data camp course. This is purely optional. Only those of you who are interested in doing those um, additional courses on programming languages or programming techniques are invited to do so. This is not obligatory, but those of you who, can, who want to um, are free to use this link. All right, so let me give over to Andreas now. Okay, thanks, Mark, and welcome back from my side. Um, let me just briefly show you that we also have, of course, classes because we are mainly teaching you the theoretical, the theory, my screen sharing will stop, so let me restart that, sorry. So we are mostly in this lecture, of course, teaching you the theoretical stuff behind empirical econ economics and giving you a first introduction to econometrics. The main idea of this course, however, is that you are also able to apply all the methods yourselves to be able to conduct your own first re research and to test your own hypotheses and to find out about the dependencies that is are in the world. To do so, we have computer exercises, uh, also, of course, within Zoom. And we have two brand new tutors uh, for you, um, Florian Fox and Eva Hümmeke who I'd like to just introduce themselves briefly. Uh, yes, I briefly start. So hello, my name is Eva. I will be your tutor together with Florian in the class and we will assist you with the class content. Florian and I, we are both in our master studies of economics. 
And uh, Florian will briefly say some uh, organizational things right now. Yes, I am looking forward to a good start of the semester and see you tomorrow and on Wednesday. All right, thank you, Eva. Uh, we have, as you just saw, we have three time slots. Um, there's a fair distribution tool in the learner app, which is called exercise slot. And we'd ask you to enter your preferences. You can rank those orders, uh, those, those um, appointments. And you can have, out of three, you can choose one and you only have to be there for one single, um, for one single class. You have until 3 p.m. Uh, this afternoon. So please, after the lecture, um, go to the learn web and enter your preferences there. And one further question we have is, uh, it would be probably good to update Zoom because we are, what we are willing to do is that we are, that you can freely choose your breakout sessions and therefore you need an, a more current version of Zoom. Yes, that's all from our side. We're looking forward to seeing you tomorrow and on Wednesday. Okay, thank you, Eva and Florian. Um, yeah, there you can see already in the in this slide uh, the three exercise slots we are offering you. From it's Tuesday ten to twelve, it's Tuesday two to four, and it's on Wednesday two to four. Just register for a slot on the loan website, and we will distribute the Zoom the Zoom session links to you afterwards. Um, as I said, in these classes, you will learn about how to apply the methodology we teach you by yourself. So you will work heavily in R and to that again, of course, we will start from scratch. We will teach you some R in the next week's lecture, but Florian and Eva are also going to teach you some R basics um, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, and we will pick up from that on next Monday. However, um, having a look at the um, data camp courses really might be might boost your R knowledge and boost, boost your skills. So everything inside the course might come easier. One final organizational point is, of course, the exam, um, because you all want to have these nine credits, I guess. So in the end of this lecture, we have an exam that is split in two parts. We have a written exam of 90 minutes that makes 70% of your final grade. And we have an R project study, which is going to take a full week and counts for 30% of your grade. The project, project study, just in contrast to the exam, you can hand in uh, as a group of three persons. The duration is one week from July 12th to 18th. And please, if you want to um, give in this exam with a certain group, just let us know. We will, um, uh, the way you can let us know, we will just find out either, we will figure that out either via the Learn Web or just by emailing us uh, the group constellations that you favor. Some uh, attention, if you resit the exam in December, there won't be an R project, but only a written exam. So take that into, your, into consideration when you plan your exams and when you plan your semester. Okay, thank you. I'm going to hand over back to you, Mark, now. Before I head over to you, Mark, um, I received a, a question via the chat, uh, namely whether or not the classes will be recorded. Um, that is not going to be the case. But on the other hand, we will we have solution videos to the exercises. That these videos are from last year, but the exercises didn't change. We will upload these solution videos and also solution hints on the learn web. So the sessions themselves won't be recorded but you'll be um, split in small breakout sessions and try to solve the exercises in little groups on your own instead. Now back to you. All right, thanks, Andres. Um, yeah, if you have other questions, please either just switch on the microphone and, and ask. Um, and if you don't like being recorded, then you can also use the chat to ask questions. And there's always somebody around to, to look at the chat and yeah I've, I've got a question yeah 
um, uh, is um, uh, the, um, when I'm not able to to do the exam um, this term, um, I will I will do it uh, in in December, and so the the exam in December um, is only the written exam. There's not the possibility to do a, a repeat a study project. This is currently the the the, the, the state. Um, yes, yes, that's the case. But I've got, but but I, but I, but I'm not going to have an, um, a malus because I didn't uh, do the the project study this term. No, no, of course not. So um, I, I would I would consider the, the 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 option to do the R project study as a bonus, and of course you're um, losing in a way. This, this possibility, but the exam in the winter term, the, the, the reset exam is just an ordinary exam and you can earn 100% of the points by resetting the exam in the winter term without the R project study. Okay, thank you very much. What, what, we, what, you, what we actually want you to know and to, to remember is that if you, if you do the um, project study in this term, and do not sit the exam in this term, then the R project study is just lost in a way. So you can't carry over the points for the project study to the next um, exam. That's, uh, please remember that. Okay, Thanks. Other questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I have a question regarding R and R studio. Um, is it inconvenient for this course to have an older version? I don't think that's a problem. Okay, thank you. But R is free in any case, so you can just um, you can just update your version. It doesn't cost anything. Yeah, it's a problem though if you have an older computer. <laughs> yes, I know that. Um, my computer at home is very old, and I'm using an old R version. But I think it's not a, not really a problem. Okay, thank you. So we are, we are not using sophisticated new modern methods. What we are doing is really um, implementing basic methods in R, because by implementing them yourself, you're actually learning them. So th there's this saying, which is deeply true, I think, that programming is learning, at least in, in this empirical uh, sciences. Okay, other questions? All right, so- There's one question, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, whether it is in the chat, whether it's possible to take the exam without taking part in the project without having a disadvantage, um, which is not possible in the summer, uh, but only for the reset exam. Exactly. Okay, but we really strongly advise you to do the R exercises. R is an excellent tool for empirical work. And um, knowing how to work with data or well, having some basic knowledge of data science, which this actually is, is um, quite important nowadays. So you should really, you should really do that. Okay. All right. So if other questions come up, then don't, don't be shy. Just ask or use the chat. Okay. So um, yeah, I've, got, I've got another question. Um, yes. Um, um, given uh, I, I do the exam in the December, there's also the possibility to to ask questions in the in the uh, winter term by mail. There's there's also support. Is my question? No, that's not the case. You will be able to use the the videos, but there will be no live support in the winter term. So it's really just a reset exam. Okay, so so no um, no no forum uh, which you supervise. Well, at least no moderated forum. Okay, yes. okay, thanks. Okay. All right. So let's start with chapter one of the textbook. Um, chapter one is more or less the motivation. Why do we need empirical economics anyway? So. Um, we know, or at least you, you have already um, uh, attended courses on microeconomics and macroeconomics, so you know that economic theory, both in micro and macroeconomic 
um, macro and macroeconomics. Economic theory implies very interesting associations between, between economic quantities. And this is not only true in, in micro and macroeconomics, that's also true in finance, that's also true in business administration. So, and, and in, a, in the wider field, that's also true um, in, in, in other sciences, actually. So theory implies associations between certain quantities. So there's a relationship between wage growth and unemployment. That's a relationship between economic growth and the interest rate. On monetary policy. Um, there's a re relationship between the price of a product and the demand for that product. So we know that economic theory implies these associations. What we do not know in general, at least not from economic theories, um, what are the quantitative um, relationships between these uh, economic variables. So the relationships are important both for, well, from a business point of view, if you, if you want to know the demand, the price elasticity of demand, that's of course very important for your price setting policy. Um, these associations are also relevant from a policy point of view, economic policy point of view, for instance, for the central banks. They, they need to know the relationship between setting the interest rate and, and the economic growth. Um, but theory is usually silent about um, the quantitative relationship between, between these quantities. All right, so to find out how much the demand declines if we increase the price, or how much wage growth is hampered by a higher rate of unemployment, or by how much the growth rate will be um, diminished by increasing the interest rate by the central banks, to, we need empirical methods. So we need these empirical methods to actually find out how much the effects, how high these effects um, are, because unless we know um, the, the size, the, the, the quantitative size of these effects, we are not in a position to actually perform policy. And that's not only true for macroeconomic policy, that's actually true in, 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 in any area of economics. Hmm. Same. Okay, so some examples. Um, we might be interested in the question, how large is the price elasticity of the cigarette demand? Um, normally, we assume that the cigarette demand will decline if prices increase, but most people think that the demand for cigarettes declines only a little if we increase the price, for instance, by increasing the, the tax on cigarettes, um, because the, the smokers are addicted. So if, if they are addicted, they are not able to diminish the demand if the prices are increased, if the taxes are increased, so most people think that the decline in cigarette demand is, is small if we increase the price. Um, however, if, we, if you are the finance minister of, of a country, then knowing this elasticity is of course very important. And if you're the health minister, knowing the elastic, elasticity is also important. So theory is again silent about the size of this price elasticity. And to find out the elasticity, we have to use empirical methods. So this is what we are going to learn to actually find out how high is the price elasticity of the cigarette demand. And you will be surprised to find that it's quite high. So even though smokers are or may be addicted, um, the demand for cigarettes declines um, quite a lot if we increase the price. And this is an interesting finding, which is not um, not given by economic theory, of course. All right, a similar question might be, what's the price elasticity of the gasoline demand? And again, this is important for uh, climate policy, this is important for tax reasons, so there are many reasons why we might be interested in the exact size of this price elasticity. So we know that 
gasoline demand will decline if we increase the taxes on, on gasoline. But by how much, we do not know from economic theory. This is an empirical question. And therefore, we have to look at the data and we have to use econometric techniques to actually find out and estimate um, this price elasticity. Another example that's the, the, the running example for, for most part of this semester, another example is the question, what is the impact of uh, on learning success of reducing the class sizes in school? Most people think that smaller classes lead to higher learning success. So um, this would be a good idea to, a good policy to implement if you want children to learn more or if you want students to learn more. Um, but of course it's expensive because if you reduce the class sizes, you need more teachers. Teachers are expensive, professors are expensive. So um, it's a relevant question to find out by how much the learning success actually increases if you spend more money on teachers or professors, how much more do the people do, do the um, pupils actually learn in that case? And this will be the running example for this course. Okay, um, another question which is relevant for you, uh, how much more can you earn with an additional year of education? So if you spend, say, three years doing a bachelor in economics, is it really worthwhile? Or is it worthwhile to spend two more years doing the master in economics? How much more are you going to earn as a master in comparison to a bachelor in economics? So um, the question in this case is how much more can you actually earn? And is it worthwhile sitting in the university courses for another two years to do the master, or should you rather start working right away? Um, because in that case, you, you, you might earn more give, over the entire life cycle. So that's also a relevant question. And to answer this question, it doesn't help to think about economic theory. To answer this question, uh, you need data, okay? So, and you need estimation techniques. So this is what we are going to do as well. And finally, an example from macroeconomics, what uh, would be the effect on the growth rate if the European Central Bank increased the interest rate by one percentage point? Of course, that's also a highly relevant question. Economic theory tells us that increasing the interest rate will decrease growth and decrease uh, the inflation rate, for instance, and the only country that argues against this economic theory, as far as I know, is currently Turkey. And um, apparently the data um, corroborate what, what economic theory tells us. So these are examples from microeconomics, from well, education economics, labor economics, and macroeconomics or uh, monetary economics. All right, we are going to use these statistical and econometric methods to actually quantify the causal effects of policies. So the causal effect is, well, it's not that easy to define what the causal effect is, but there's a tri tricky way to do so. And to do so, to actually define what we mean by a causal effect, we introduce the theoretical idea of a randomized controlled experiment. That's the kind of experiments that are usually done in the natural sciences. So for instance, in physics, you do experiments about mechanics, you do experiments in quantum physics, any kind of experiments. And in other natural sciences, it's usually also possible to do randomized controlled experiments. Medicine is a very important example if you want to find out if a vaccine is actually working, you need a randomized controlled field study to find out whether a vaccine is working or not. Okay. So these randomized controlled um, experiments are then used to define what we mean by a causal effect. And the definition is as follows. We define the causal effect by what we measure as the difference between the control group and the treatment group in a randomized controlled experiment. So for instance, if we want to find out the 
demand, um, the price elasticity of cigarette demand, the randomized controlled experiment could look as follows. We could um, randomly assign a certain group of the population to a new price policy for cigarettes and then find out what the price elasticity for that group is and compare that to the other group where, um, where different policies implemented. So in this case, we have two groups. We have two different kinds of treatment or one treatment and one control group. Uh, we compare the outcome in these two different groups and the difference is defined as the causal effect. Um, for instance, if we look at the effect of class size on the learning success, we might also conduct an experiment. We might randomly choose a number of classes in a certain Bundesland, for instance, or in, in, in the city of Münster. So we might pick certain classes in certain schools randomly and split them. So we reduce the class size by half. Uh, we use more teachers in those classes to teach these smaller classes. And then after a year or after a number of years, we conduct um, a test. We test both groups, the students which are taught in small classes and the students which are taught in usual normal classes, normal sized classes, and we compare the oops, and we compare the learning outcome between these two different groups. And the size of this effect is then defined as the causal effect of smaller class sizes. And you can see it's quite expensive to implement such a randomized controlled experiment. And in the case of the cigarettes, it's practically not really possible because the group that gets the, the cheaper cigarettes is going to sell these cigarettes to the other group. Okay. So in that case, um, it's not that easy to actually implement a randomized controlled experiment. Then in the education effect example, where we wonder about the um, growth of, of earnings if you do a master or a bachelor course in economics, um, how would a randomized controlled experiment look like in that case? Well, in that case, you would assign a group of students who just leave school to do either a bachelor course in economics or you forbid them to do this course in, in economics. And then after the course, those that did the course are compared to those that did not do this course. Um, you compare the average level of earnings between these two different groups, and then you can find out what the randomized controlled experiments would tell you about the causal effect of doing a bachelor course in economics. And again, this is practically not really implementable because you cannot force people to do a course in economics and you actually are not able to forbid them to do such a course. So there are legal bounds to actually performing such randomized controlled experiments in, in many cases. And finally, the, um, uh, the interest rate policy of the European Central Bank, it's not really thinkable that you could randomly implement interest rate policies just to see what the effect of the growth rate is. So, Looking at these examples, it becomes quite clear that actually implementing these randomized controlled experiments is either not possible or only possible to a very limited extent. Nevertheless, the theoretical ideal of a randomized controlled experiment is very useful because we can use this theoretical idea, this thought experiment, if you like, as the definition as a tool to define what we mean by a causal effect. So this is kind of benchmark and using the data we actually have without performing randomized um, experiments is the art of econometrics. So in reality, um, in reality, what we have is usually not data from randomized controlled experiments. What we have in reality are non-experimental data. And these are also called observational data. And this is what we have to work with. Because uh, actually performing randomized controlled experiments is often not, um, not doable. Well, there are, of course, if you use non-experimental data or observational data, 
there are a number of problems in empirical research and we are really going to deal with these problems over the entire semester. So this is just a brief, brief idea. Problems that might happen are missing variables. Problems that might happen are endogeneity issues. For instance, um, a smaller class size might increase the learning success. But if the class has a high learning success, you might also say, well, we can increase the class size. So the, the causal direction might go in a different, different way. So endogeneity issues are also quite important, and we're going to talk about a lot during the semester. And of course, um, you know that from statistics one and two, correlation and causality are different things. If two quantities are correlated, that does not really mean that one of these quantities causes the other quantity. It only means that there's some kind of relationship, and even that seeming relationship could be just random. Okay, so there are a number of typical problems in empirical research. All right, so let's really define what we mean by a causal effect. And the definition in the textbook by Stock and Watson is as follows. We define the causal effect of a treatment as the effect that can or could be measured in, a, in an ideal, randomized, controlled experiment. Oops, sorry. Um, ideal means that it's actually implementable. Uh, no, ideal means that we, we perform a thought experiment and we assume that all the, all the units that we um, assign to the treatment group are actually treated. All the units, for instance, persons or whatever, are, that are assigned to the control group are actually not treated. So this is meant by ideal. So we can actually um, do this randomized controlled experiment in, a, in an ideal setting. Second, it's a randomized experiment, which means All right, saying so that was a short interruption, but I think that's not really a problem. So if we want to assign students in primary school to small sized classes, then it might happen that the person who actually assigns the students looks at the uh, learning at the past learning success of the students. So those that are that have done poorly in school might be more often assigned to the treatment class with small classes. And students that performed brightly in the past might be more likely to be assigned to the control group with normal class sizes. In that case, is, of course, there will be a bias in our evaluation. So randomized means that we actually perform um, some kind of randomization, throwing dice by using the random number generator in the computer to assign the individuals to one of these groups. And finally, it's a controlled experiment, which means that we have a control group. So we only assign part of the population to the treatment, because in that case, we are able to uh, measure the difference in the final outcome between these two groups. Okay, so that's the definition. And this is an important definition, and it's a typically economic definition because it's very pragmatic. Economists tend to be very pragmatic, and this is a very pragmatic definition of causal effect. Um, causality is a deep, more or less philosophical question, and it might be really, really hard to define from a philosophical point of view what we mean by causality. But as economists, we do it much more pragmatically. We just define the causal effect 
by looking at the difference between the treatment group and the control group in an ideal randomized controlled experiment. And that's the main idea of using this thought experiment of a randomized controlled experiment. The main idea is the definition of causal effect and to have a benchmark, an ideal benchmark um, that we can use later on to actually implement empirical estimation methods that can be used for observational data. Right. Okay, what kind of data are we going to work with? Well, I already said that we are going to work with experimental data. Um, that we would like to work with experimental data because in many cases using experimental data is not really implementable. Experimental data might be too expensive. For instance, if we are interested in the question whether reducing class sizes to 10 students per class, we would need at least two or three times as many teachers as we have available nowadays, at least for, for the treatment classes. So in that case, we would have to hire a huge number of additional teachers, which is very expensive. So in that case, um, experimental data are not really implementable because that would be too expensive. And in many other situations, um, actually performing an experiment is very, very expensive. A well-known example is the uh, negative interest rate, Bürgergeld, it, it's sometimes called, or the unconditional income. So an income that is provided to the population whether or not they work and really independently of, of their actions. So kind of Grundeinkommen. I think that's uh, another term in, in the German policy debate. And of course, if you want to find out what is the effect of the negative interest rate on the behavior of the population, you would have to perform an experiment. You would have to assign a certain number of the population to the treatment group that actually receive this unconditional income. And then you have to continue giving them this unconditional income and observe their behavior and compare that to the behavior of the rest of the population. And of course, paying this treatment group is very expensive and it doesn't help to do that for one year because in that case, the experiment is not really um, an image of what you, you are theoretically planning to do because the unconditional income is only really useful if it's paid um, over the entire life cycle. So in that case, you would have to implement an experiment that unconditionally, unconditionally gives this unconditional income to a huge number, or at least to a large number of people for over their entire lifetime. So that would be really, really expensive. And therefore there are not many studies that look at the effect of this unconditional income or negative interest rate or work on it. All right, sometimes it's just too difficult to implement an experiment. For instance, um, using this example with uh, cigarette prices, it might be possible to define a certain treatment group that is able to buy cigarettes for a reduced price, but then you have to monitor them to, um, to avoid that they actually sell these cheaper cigarettes to the other group. That might be possible, but it would be really, really difficult. So in that case, there are practical limits to implementing such an experiment. It's theoretically possible, but in practice, it would be too difficult to implement that. And finally, it might not be ethical to actually um, perform such an experiment. Uh, for instance, if you're interested in the effect of passive smoking on kindergarten children, um, you are probably not really um, uh, deliberating um, that, that a certain group of kindergarten children is exposed to, to passive smoking, because that clearly would be unethical. So, performing such an experiment is simply not, um, not ethical and you, you can't do that. So in many cases, 
experimental data are not available because they are too expensive, they are too difficult to monitor, or it's simply unethical to, to perform such an experiment. In that case, what we use is observational data. And we, we've just learned that. And there are actually three kinds of observational data around. And we are going to work with mostly one of them. And at the end with, with another one, we won't work with the third one. So we, what we are going to deal with a lot is cross-sectional data. So most of the time we are going to work with cross-sectional data, which means that we look at a large number of units, individuals, firms, countries, households, workers, whatever, a large number of units at the same point of time. And we, um, we collect the data about these units at one point of time, and then we evaluate these data. This is what we are going to start with. So most of the time, at, at least at the start, we are going to work with cross-sectional data. The second class of data sets is called time series data. And we are not going to work with time series data. Time series data means that you evaluate, that you collect data about one unit over many periods. So for instance, you look at Germany as a unit, as a country, and you look at the growth rate over the past 50 years or so. Or you look at one firm and look at the profits of this firm over many quarters. Or you look at one stock on the stock exchange, say, I don't know, uh, Allianz Versicherung, and you look at the stock day after day, trading day after trading day. And you look at the price of the stock over time, that would be an example of time series data. So it's cross-sectional data is many units, but only one point of time. Time series data is one unit, but many time periods and panel data, which we are going to deal with towards the end of the term is both. So you look at many units or at least more than one unit and you look at many periods or at least two periods. Okay, so if you have more than one unit and you collect data about these units at more than one point of time or more than one period, then what you get is panel data. Okay, so three kinds of data sets. There are other types of data, say spell data, for instance, um, or durational data, but we are not going to deal with those. Okay, so most of the time in economics, we are going to work with cross-sectional data, time series data, or panel data. And in this course, most of the time, we are going to work with cross-sectional data. All right. So, in short, in this course, what you are going to do, what you are going to learn is um, the following. First, you are going to learn methods to estimate causal effects from observational data. You have already learned what causal effect means. You have already learned the definition of a causal effect. Um, but in this course, you are going to learn to actually estimate these causal effects from observational data mostly cross-sectional data. So learning methods is the main aim of this course. The second important objective is that you are um, learning to apply these methods using data analytics software, data science software in a way. So it's not only learning these methods theoretically, you should also, also be able to apply these methods in empirical analyses. Then you're going to um, perform your own econometric analyses, um, either in the R project study or in the exercises. Or if you like, of course, you can also perform econometric analyses on your own using publicly available data, for instance. Uh, you will learn how to assess econometric studies done by other persons because reading about the outcome of an econometric study um, should be done in a critical way. So many econometric studies, no, some econometric studies might not be really useful. 
So you, you will learn criteria to actually assess econometric studies. And having learned these criteria, of course, you can also apply these criteria to your own econometric studies. And finally, even though that's less important in this course, you are um, going to learn forecasting methods for time series. No, I think this, this is wrong. Andreas, I think we, <laughs> we should skip that. Um, we are not going to do that. Sorry about that. This will be part of a different course. All right. Um, so I'm now handing over to Andreas, unless there are any questions. Apparently, that's not the case. All right. So I'm handing over to, to Andreas now. Okay, thanks again, Mark. Um, before we continue to why we chose R to work with, uh, let me just briefly go back to the data types um, that we've talked about, uh, that uh, Professor Trede talked about to you. Um, if you recall your very first semester in statistics, one, we asked you to fill in the questionnaire. And after we had all your responses, that questionnaire and all these responses obviously formed a cross-sectional data because we had many students who answered many questions on many subjects, but only in a single point in time. So we had a cross-sectional data set on our first semester students. We are going to uh, hand air, we are going to uh, ask you to do the same uh, questionnaire in this semester again as well, we will send around the link in uh, one of the, the next weeks. So what we will get then is another set of responses. And for all, in all, in total, what we obtain is a panel data set now on two points in time. Of course, not of the whole population of first semester students, because all those business administration students are missing uh, our course. But on the, on the share of economic students, we will get a panel data set. So um, be ready to um, receive this questionnaire again. And um, I hope that many of you will uh, again answer the questions in the questionnaire to give us an, an in, give us some insights in uh, the student's life. Now let's come back to the available software that we have. Of course, we have we want you to apply all the methods we teach you. Um, to real economic problems, to real economic data sets, and not only learn about them in theory. To do so, we have a variety of statistical learning, uh, statistical software programs. You might do that in Excel, in eViews, Gauss, MATLAB, Python, R, SAS, SPSS, Stata, and so on and so on. There's a lot, a large list of potential candidates to do the stuff that we want you to do in. Available with the university is Excel, EDUs, MATLAB, Python, R, SPSS, and Stata. And out of this already shortened list, um, there's at least, I think, four programs that is that are useful for our course, that is EDUs, Python, Stata, and R. And going down a list of criteria uh, on these programs, such as the price of the program, the accessibility from home, the user friendliness, flexibility, and the usage, we will, uh, we derived, we ended up at the decision, not today, not in the past month, but years ago to at least for now stick with R because R is free software. It is accessible from everywhere, of course, also then from home. You don't need to be uh, enlisted at the university to access the software as for example, for uh, to, to freely access Stata or eViews or MATLAB. It is, although it doesn't seem to be in the, on first glance, very user-friendly. It has very nice um, properties that don't force you to um, have already been coding, to have already a lot, a lot, a lot large experience in programming, but you can do that and you can learn that step by step because it has a very um, low and a very a rather flat learning curve compared to other programming languages. R is super flexible 
uh, it can be extended to nearly any task you might consider. Uh, if you want to do climate modeling, there are packages in that for R. If you want to model financial returns, there are packages for that in R. If you want to model anything, there's basically a package in R that can either do the job for you or at least assist you in doing the job. There is, I think, it's in the tens of thousands of packages that are currently being published for R. So having a look at either that list or at the search engine, I'll show you that in a minute, um, will very often help you in the process of how to solve certain problems. We'll be using a few packages here and there in this course to either get data sets from or to um, have additional methods to work with. And finally, the usage either in practice, so in professional practice after your studies or even in science after you stay at the university is um, given for R as well. There's many companies, many huge and big companies that use R in their data science um, uh, I'm missing the word here in their data science projects. Um, there is, of course, a very huge community that is using R in science. Um, that is, of course, both true for Python as well. But then again, Python is little less user friendly, you need a little more experience in coding in general, uh, as you would need in R. So for this course, we are going to stick to R. R has lots of capabilities. You can do data management, so loading, saving data sets. That is the most basic task you can do in R um, to get your data into R or to, again, store your data on the hard disk once you did any kind of transformation on the data and don't want to do that all over again the next day that you restart R. You can, of course, transform data in more or less any way you can think of. Um, you can join tables. You can select different items from tables. You can, of course, uh, delete delete items, you can filter, search for something, and so on. So there's a huge um, functionality in data management and in, in data transformation. You can also do basic statistics with, the, with the, just with a stats package in R that is loaded in R in base R by default. You can compute descriptive statistics like the mean or the median or any kind of quantile or the standard deviation of, our, of your data. You can create graphs of certain aspects of the data. So for example, if you want to display the student teacher ratio, so the class size of a data set against uh, the number or the percentage of English, English learners in that class, you can just create a plot, have a look at that plot. And then again, from the plot, derive your first conclusions and derive your first insights in that data. What we'll use heavily in this lecture, of course, is regression analysis, because that's the workhorse of econometrics. We will run several regressions. We will start with simple regressions, where simple just means we only have a single regressor, but we can also later on, or not later on, but in the middle of this course, we'll run multiple regressions, meaning we just add other variables that are either have direct influence on our uh, variable that we're interested in or just uh, there are, are there as a control variable. What that might be, we'll learn again in some other day. After running regression, we can also run model diagnostics on that very regression. We can see how well the model fitted to our data, how well um, we can uh, describe the relationship with the model that we've just estimated. We can, of course, use R for forecasting, and we will forecast or we will predict values for, for example, classes that don't appear in the data set, but we might consider of what might be the outcome of a class that has 15 pupils, although there might not be any class with 15 pupils in the data set. So that's... Um, just predicting a new outcome for a, a, hypoth a hypothetical data point. You can also run simulations in R. We are not going to do that um, broadly in this course. And R has a very powerful programming language. You will, of course, all you do is programming, but R can do 
um, so much more than what we are going to encounter in this lecture. So you can really um, use all the programming techniques that you might have already encountered in, for example, in school, in informatics classes, and so on. All of that can be done in R as well. R, of course, runs either on either uh, operation system, so on Windows, Mac OS, or Linux, which is very good because we don't restrict you to have a Windows computer. You can use whatever computer you'd like. There is a online help. There's also an offline help inside of R, so you don't necessarily need to be connected to the internet. How to use that help, we'll, we'll see in the next lecture, of course, and also in the tutorials. And as Mark also um, mentioned in one of the first slides, this um, Ökonometrie, das Arbeitsbuch uh, of Ludwig von Auer, is one, one optional book that you might have a look into um, to see um, further in R. For the exercises and classes, of course, please install R and R Studio. We are not going to do that in class. There are excellent, uh, or there is one. There's a description to how to do that in the Learn Web, and you can, uh, if that fails for you, so if you cannot install either R or our studio, just drop us a line uh, at the email address we put in Learn Web. It's meconhelp at gmail.com. And all four of us are frequently reading all the mails that come into that account, and we will answer any of the emails you want. Uh, we will answer any questions you might have. Um, let me just show you two additional very helpful sources of help in R and to get information on R just very briefly. Um, I just have to change my screen sharing. Um, so just give me a second. One is rseek.org. I hope that you can see that right now. Mm, there you go, rseek.org. Yeah, you should be able to see our seek. Is that right? Yeah, perfect. Um, because I don't see a frame around the window. Um, okay, rseek.org is a Google search engine that specifically gives you results on our related questions. So the only thing, uh, if you have a question on R, is to precisely ask that question. So, for example, if you want to create a vector, vector with the same elements. Just type that into RSeq. If you want to create an object, we will see what that is in, in, in the next lesson. Uh, that contains always the same elements, so 100 times the value 5. That is often a task you need to do. If you don't know how to do that, just type it into RSeq, uh, search for that, and very often you will be directed to a website called Stack Overflow, which is a very, very helpful website because it's an online forum, but it's not uh, the, we can accept the cookies here. The great thing about our, uh, about Stack Overflow is that it's not arranged in temporal order, but in order of the best reply to the question. So the best answer to the question is always the first reply that you see. So what you see as first answer to the question is most likely the one you're looking for. So it's very easy and very convenient to find help to any coding related. Stack Overflow doesn't uh, limit to our questions, uh, to any coding question or any question you might have. And you'll very quickly get answers. And here the answer is to use the rep command, a command we, will might, we might encounter in the next weeks. Um, the, this is, of course, the correct answer to the question. And you, have, you would have found that very quickly. A second thing is if you want to have a very uh, new, a very current textbook on uh, in an introduction to R, then I can recommend the introduction to R of Rafael Irizarry. He uh, is a biostatistic, biostatistician in Harvard. And this book has been created by his, by his lecture notes, basically. And the book is available online for free. Um, this one, what we can see here, is not a PDF version, but it's our Markdown version. So basically, this book that you can see here is, it has been created in R itself. So also something that R can do, it can create books and 
PDF files. And if you go to the chapters one, two, three, and maybe chapter four, you get lots of R basics in a very nice fashion and a very helpful fashion to look at. I'll put this um, both RSeq and the link to the book also in the Learn Web in the afternoon. I think that's it from us today. Um, so if you have any questions and let me have a brief look into the chat, I'll just stop. Yeah, there's one question in the chat. Yeah. Can you use RSeq in German? Uh, that's a good question. Just try it. I don't know. Never did that. Uh, I usually search everything in English uh, because the most replies you will get are in English because there's a huge R community and almost everyone is talking English. You might get um, usable results in German or in other languages as well, but it's most likely to get the best results in English. And there's one question, do we need R and R Studio or just one of both? You need both. R is just the programming language and the statistic program itself. Without R Studio, it works, but it looks extremely ugly because it is only a console window where you can only type in single lines of code. And R Studio is a really powerful browser that gives you so much opportunity to work with large R scripts, to see which variables you have in the environment and so on and so on. Um, so please install both of them. And the next question is, do the exercises start this week? Yes, they do. They start tomorrow. Uh, when do we know in which slot we got? Well, the, um, the tool is online until 3 p.m., so just for 90 minutes from now. Uh, and once that's done, we, I will start the allocation process and you will give me an hour or something. Uh, you will uh, learn that by today, today's evening at latest. And a question, which tasks are intended? Um, I think for this week and maybe for the next week, the, just the introductory hour tasks uh, are intended to be done in this week. So maybe one until three or five, I don't know exactly. The exam will be in English only. Yes, that guess is correct. Um, okay, are there any further questions? Okay. That doesn't seem to be the case, then enjoy the rest of the week and your first week of lectures this semester. And we'll see you on Monday again and have fun in the classes on uh, tomorrow and on Wednesday. Bye. Thanks, see you then.